All right. Hello, uh, this is Dan Estrada, um, and this is lesson two for engineering ethics at NGIT. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the course. All right, so this is engineering ethics. This is lesson two. This is our second lecture. Um, remember, these videos are supposed to be just a brief introduction to the reading for the week. Uh, I give a lot of readings. Um, they're on lots of different topics, and these lectures are supposed to sort of tie the whole discussion together. So we're on lesson two. Topic for lesson two is the scope of ethical consideration. And I just want to spend a few minutes going over the readings for this week so you know what uh, is going on for this lesson. Um, remember, we're at the very beginning of the course, and so we're really just uh, sort of introducing the idea of uh, values and how they relate to engineering. Um, last week, this was done in a very general way, just talking about how do values relate to engineered systems. We looked at a couple of cases from Lincoln Winter. Strogatz. Um, uh, remember, your uh, replies for lesson one will be due on Tuesday at midnight. So that's uh, tomorrow night. Uh, I'm recording this on Monday. So tomorrow at midnight, Tuesday at midnight. Um, you're required to leave 250 word replies, uh, paragraph length replies uh, in the discussion forum. That's by Tuesday at midnight for full credit. I've got a couple of emails already uh, panicked about the grades for lesson one. Uh, remember, your grade for lesson one uh, is out of a total of 100 points. That's 50 points for the discussion, uh, 30 points for the replies, and 20 points for your introduction. So a lot of people were looking online, saw that they had you know, only 20 points because of their introduction, or you know, uh, much less than they wanted for their 100 points for the lesson. Uh, if you haven't written your replies yet, that's 30 points. It's not reflected in your lesson. Uh, in general, if you want to see the grade for your particular assignments, go to the assignment itself. And underneath the assignment, there's a little rating. Um, the rating is your point value that I've given you. Uh, no one else can see that rating but me. Um, but that tells you what you got in your individual assignments, and then your grades in the middle will say what you got for the entire lesson. Um, if you have questions, keep sending me emails. Uh, and uh, I will be, uh, as always, I will be holding the online section uh, tomorrow afternoon from 12 to 1.30. Uh, you can show up. Uh, I'm going to do the lecture here, so during the discussion tomorrow, I'll spend maybe 10 minutes just reviewing the material, um, and then I'll just open up it up for discussion. I'll be, I'll be there for about an hour for open discussion on the course material and to answer any questions you have. From 12 to 1.30, uh, the link will be on Moodle tomorrow. Actually, the link is at the top of Moodle. If you go to the very top, here's the Hangout link. So I'll be there tomorrow at 12.30. All right. Let's jump into the lesson. Um, this week is the scope of ethical consideration. So last week we talked just very generally about how do values relate to engineering? Right? What are the values of engineers? How do the engineering projects reflect the values of engineers? What are we doing when we're building all these systems? Um, so that, that was going on last week. This week, uh, we're still just introducing the idea of values in engineering, but with a little more of a tighter focus. Um, what I want to talk about this week is the scope of ethical consideration uh, and what falls under the scope of ethical consideration. Um, and then the readings this week are supposed to uh, emphasize this theme. So let me go ahead and jump into the Prezi. And again, this Prezi uh, is linked on the website. Uh, when I'm done with this video, I'll post a video right above this. So here's the Prezi and if you're keeping track, uh, the secret word for lesson two is scope. Scope. So you can fill out the attendance sheet for this week with the uh, secret word for lesson two. Uh, the lecture secret word is scope. I'll have a different secret word for the online hangout tomorrow. All right, this lesson we're looking at the scope of ethical consideration. And in general, the kinds of questions we're asking this week is what should be the scope of ethical consideration? What is the scope of ethical consideration for some particular decision, for some group? Um, and by scope here, I mean what is the extent uh, that is covered by ethics? Right? What considerations fall under ethics? Um, who gets considered by ethics? Um, what people, what processes, what jobs? fall under the scope of ethical consideration, and what maybe doesn't fall under the scope of ethical consideration, right? What doesn't require ethical thought and uh, discussion? 
traits of which issues, which perspectives uh, are included in our discussions of values, which are excluded, uh, which values are considered important, which values are neglected or ignored. <coughs> and uh, I mean, you know, within a company, uh, maybe by an individual, what, what values is an individual considered important, what values is an individual ignore, or maybe for a company, um, or maybe for a culture or society. Right, um, how wide, how broad is the scope of ethical consideration going to be? But what methods do we use to determine the scope of ethical consideration? Right, what procedures do we have in place for deciding that the ethical standards have been met or not? Um, do some perspectives matter more than others? When we're, when we're weighing all the values at stake in some engineering project, do some values matter more than others? Do some positions? Uh, does the boss matter more? Does the public interest matter more? Right, how do we decide these things? Right, so these are all the kinds of questions that fall under this general theme of the scope of ethical consideration. So, you know, I guess sometimes people have a little bit of confusion from last week. Right? Last week we talked about values in engineering, but this week we're talking more specifically about the scope. So when I say scope, I mean the extent of the subject matter. Right? Uh, uh, what falls under the purview right, um, of that topic. Um, the natural thing to think about when we're talking about scope or things like the diagrams, maybe engineers uh, will be used to this kind of thing. Uh, or thinking logically about the topic and about what falls under the topic. So if you're in the logic class, they talk about the universe of discourse, right? So here's uh, the universe of discourse here is we're talking about all the animals, right? and all of these things here uh, are animals or properties of animals. And then the circles uh, describe certain kinds of properties, right? So this blue circles can swim, everything in the blue circle are things that can swim, everything in the orange circle are things that have legs, everything in the red circle has fins. Notice that everything that has fins also can swim, right? So the scope of all the things with fins falls under the scope of things that can swim. Right, so uh, uh, this is just for logic, we're not talking about ethics here, we're just talking about the kinds of creatures and what properties they have. Right, so some of these creatures, like humans, uh, have all of these properties, they have legs, they breathe air, they can swim, they're, they're animals. Um, oysters fall in none of these categories, but are still animals. Right, so uh, understanding how these animals get categorized is understanding how uh, these different properties have different scopes, right? So uh, the scope of the property can swim is all the things that fall under that category. The scope of prop things that be there are all the things that fall under that category, and those are different things, right? So when we're considering different properties, these have different scopes. Um, maybe another example here, right? So here's the circle of zombies, here's the circle of robots, here's the circle of aliens. Uh, zombies and robots neither have emotion. Zombies and aliens, they both have advanced technology. Zombies and aliens both have a taste for flesh, uh, and all three have the desire to kill all humans. Right, so so right, the point here is that uh, these different creatures have different values, and the way these values intersect describe what they have in common. Right, so they both have no emotions. Uh, the zombies and robots have no emotions. So uh, this is what I mean by scope. How what is the extent of uh, a property? Um, in in our case, we're going to be talking about ethical values. So what is the extent of ethical values? Who falls under that extent? Right? Who is given consideration when we're thinking about values and ethics? I mean, who isn't given consideration? All right, so uh, that's just to introduce you to the topic. Um, the first thing in, from the readings that I want to talk about, uh, it, this, this is where we introduce the Code of Ethics from the NSPE. The NSPE is the National Society for Professional Engineers. This is a professional society. Uh, the, uh, all the different branches of engineering, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, automotive engineers, um, all these different branches of engineering have their own professional societies, and the professional societies are supposed to, um, uh, they're supposed to provide a sort of professional collegiate uh, uh, group where professionals can talk to each other, they can collaborate, they can represent themselves um, legally or in front of government. Uh, so, for instance, the NSPE writes up this Code of Ethics for Engineers. The Code of Ethics describes the ethical standards of the NSPE, and if there's ever an ethical violation, um, the Code of Ethics can be used in a, a court of law, in a trial, um, as, as, a, as a standard for the professional society, so that when someone demonstrates that they haven't met those standards, this might be uh, 
justification for revoking someone's engineering license or maybe even uh, more severe punishments. Uh, but the National Society of Professional Engineers is supposed to be the professional society that represents all engineers in these kinds of cases, represents the interests of engineers, uh, represents the, pub the public interests of engineers. Right? So uh, uh, it's an, an interface between uh, the public and the professional society. And, and like I said, one of the things that the NSPE does is it writes up this code of ethics for engineers. This isn't the only thing it does, but this is one of the things it does. Uh, we spend, I believe it's week six, it might be week seven, uh, going over the code of ethics for engineers in uh, much more detail, where we'll actually read through the whole code. I don't want to do that now. Uh, what I want to do right now is just look at the very beginning. So the a preamble, for a document like this, the preamble usually describes to you the motivations for having a code of ethics. And so what I want to do is I want to read the preamble and I want to read the fundamental canons, uh, which is just at the very beginning of the National uh, of the Code of Ethics for Engineers. Um, if you want to read it, uh, you can. Uh, there's a link to it on the website. Um, it's also in the appendix of your uh, textbook. Um, the NSPE Code of Ethics, but also the uh, Code of Ethics for lots of other engineering societies. Uh, also, uh, computer engineers, um, software engineers, have, has its own Code of Ethics. And the Code of Ethics uh, for each of these uh, engineering societies are pretty similar. Um, they differ in just some of the details that are specific to that uh, discipline. Um, but uh, all of them have some things in common, and the fundamental canons, um, they're not identical across all the engineering societies, but they're very close. So I'm going to read the one for the uh, NSPE. Uh, it's supposed to be this sort of generic engineer code of ethics. Um, and you might want to look at the specific code of ethics for your uh, discipline uh, in the back of the book. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read the preamble and the fundamental canons. So the preamble, engineering is an important and learned profession. As members of this profession, engineers are expected to exhibit the highest standards of honesty and integrity. Engineering has a direct and vital impact for the quality of life for all people. Accordingly, the services provided by engineers require honesty, impartiality, fairness, and equity, and must be dedicated to the protection of the public health, safety, and welfare. Engineers must perform a standard of professional behavior that requires adherence to the highest principles of ethical conduct. Right, so the preamble, this is supposed to motivate why do we have this code of ethics for engineers? Well, it's because engineers have a huge impact on the quality of life for all people, and so they must be held to the highest standards of honesty and impartiality and so on. Right? It's because engineers have this important role in society that they have, this, uh, that they have these ethical standards to meet. Right, this is a little bit of what we talked about last, last week in lesson one. Um, the canons, the fundamental canons, are the principles that... Uh, govern the ethics for engineers. And the way that the code of ethics works is that it lists the fundamental canons, and then the rest of the uh, code is just elaborating on what these canons mean in specific situations. Uh, so I'm going to read the canons now. We'll go over the full code later on in the semester. But the fundamental canons are uh, that engineers, in the fulfillment of their professional duties, shall, one, hold paramount to the safety, health, and welfare of the public, Two, perform services only in their area of competence. Three, issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. Four, act for each employer as, or, or client as a faithful agent and trustee. Five, avoid deceptive acts. And six, conduct yourself honorably, responsibly, and ethically, and lawfully, so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the profession. All right, so these are the core principles on which the entire ethical code is grounded. Uh, let me just make some comments. So first, uh, hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Notice that the very first canon, the very first principle on which the entire code of ethics is based is the safety, health, and welfare of the public. And this is common. I think this is a quiz question, if you're paying your attention. But I think this is common across all the uh, ethical codes that the safety, health, and welfare of the public, the public interest, is the fundamental canon, is the highest, uh, first is the paramount concern, right? the, uh, the most important concern of all these canons, health, safety, and welfare of the public. Um, uh, engineers should only perform in their area of competence. It's because you're competent, because you have this technical training, that you can do these services in the first place. So it's important for the ethical code that you stay within your bounds of expertise. Um, that you should only issue statements in an objective and truthful manner. And notice that num number three is about objective, objectivity and truthfulness. Number five is about avoiding deceptive acts. 
And number four is about acting as a faithful client and trustee or uh, agent as trustee to your clients or employers. Um, right, these are all about truthfulness and honesty. Um, and uh, uh, when we get to this in the lesson plan, we're going to talk about this under the umbrella term of integrity. Integrity, not just being honest and truthful, um, but uh, being objective, being reliable, um, performing uh, to a high standard. This is what we mean by integrity. And again, this is absolutely essential for the Code of Ethics for Engineers. <clears throat> so uh, we'll go about this, uh, we'll go into the ethical code in more detail later on in the semester. But for our purposes here, when we're talking about the scope of ethical consideration, uh, we might ask, how far does this ethical code extend, right? What's covered underneath this ethical code? Uh, so for instance, it talks about the health, safety, welfare of the public. Who is the public? Right? Uh, how does the public differ from other groups that we might be interested in? So a business is often going to be interested in its clients, or its consumers, right? the end users. How do those people differ from the public? Uh, what about other interested groups? Um, voters, right? Um, how are the voters different from the public? Uh, uh, I think less than half, half of the eligible voters voted in the last election. Right, so what is the difference between the people who vote and the people who uh, are in the public generally? Um, how about citizens? Right, not all the people in this country are citizens. Uh, how do they matter? Do they get do they get counted in the public? Right. Uh, sorry. So these are questions about the scope of ethical consideration. How do these properties? And what is the extent of these properties? And how do these properties line up with other uh, uh, with other ways of categorizing people? Um, the NSPE lists the public welfare, safety, health, and welfare of the public as the paramount concern, as the first fundamental canon. But we may ask, should the public always be the primary concern for engineers? Um, are there other things that might take precedence over the public uh, uh, that you don't run over costs? Is, uh, I mean, so this is going to be one of the big challenges we'll see over and over again in this class is that on the one, uh, one hand, the resources, uh, and on the other hand, safety. And it's often the case that when there are big safety disasters, it's because people compromise, compromised on other uh, demands for a project, um, mostly financial, but uh, also significantly time resources. Right? So we just don't have enough time. We need this done today. Uh, and we need this done today uh, so badly that we might end up cutting corners, and these cut corners might end up posing a safety risk to the public. Right? So how do we weigh the safety of the public on the one hand versus uh, other kinds of issues and constraints for projects, financial constraints, time constraints, other kinds of resource constraints. And how do you weigh these against each other? How do you know what the proper balance is? Right? I mean, you can't, uh, if, if everything gets subsumed under uh, the safety of the public, um, then maybe you can't run a uh, profitable business, right? So how do you weigh the uh, sustainability of your business, the success of your business versus the safety, health, and welfare of the public? Um, these are the kinds of concerns that fall under this, uh, this discussion of the scope of ethical consideration. Um, is the public the broadest scope of ethical consideration? Or are there broader concerns that we might address? Uh, so think about these kinds of questions. If you want to talk about what the scope of ethical consideration is uh, for engineers uh, in terms of these canons, that's one thing you might talk about this lesson. Um, Another thing you might talk about in uh, your textbook on page 105, 106, there's a couple of reading questions uh, for that chapter. Um, and it, the, the, questions raise, uh, the questions that are raised are about uh, how some groups might uh, stand in relation to other groups or might even conflict with other groups. So within an organi organization, you have uh, the organization does not always act as a, a unified group. Let me take off that. Um, all right. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So, how do the interests of one group match the interests or relate to the interests of another? Um, even within a business, you have lots of different uh, interests that might uh, be in conflict with some project. So, you know, management wants something, but the consumers want another thing, and the shareholders want a different thing. Um, 
right? So how do you balance all of these interests to make as many people happy as possible? But, but that's just within an organization. The organization also has to uh, worry about its competitors, um, has to worry about uh, the regulations from governments that uh, constrain what it can do and uh, what it can and cannot do, right? government officials and regulators who are uh, overseeing the project. Um, uh, might issue fines or other kinds of penalties for doing something wrong. Um, voters, advocacy groups, public interest groups uh, might not like what you're doing. Um, uh, other interested parties, social media, um, you know, maybe you're doing some uh, engineering project, but it's controversial, like the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, that gets a bunch of protesters and a bunch of media discussion uh, about whether that project should even go up. Right? Um, how do you weigh these interests? As an engineer, uh, what is your responsibility in a case like this where there's a big public outcry and there's protesting going on uh, for a uh, project that you're doing? Right. If the interest is in the safety, health, and welfare of the public and the public is protesting, right, how, do you, um, how do you balance this against the need to, to do your job? Um, especially for engineers, and this can be problematic, especially for engineers, uh, you're... Uh, your livelihood depends on doing this job. Your career depends on doing this job. Uh, refusing to do a job for uh, some reasons uh, might result in you getting fired. Uh, how do you balance these uh, personal life needs that you have versus these other sort of ethical considerations for the health, safety, and welfare of the public? Right? I, I mean, maybe your boss, maybe the person who hired you uh, doesn't care that much about the safety of the public. I mean, they want you to do, to do a job that you know is unsafe. And if you don't do that job, you get fired. Right, so what do you do in this kind of situation? Uh, uh, I'll say uh, up front that there are no easy answers to th these kinds of questions. This is partly why ethics is so difficult. Uh, 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 how to balance the demands of your job versus the demands of all the other demands in your life. Uh, these are not easy questions. And these are not questions that I can answer for you. Uh, these are questions that you have to think about yourself, think about your own values, Think about your own uh, relationships and how these things matter to you um, and how you balance them against each other. And th that's something I can't answer for you because I don't know the details of your life. I don't know your values. Um, I don't know what job you'll have uh, exactly. And so I don't know what the best way of managing these things are. That's why you need to be thinking for yourself about these issues, uh, about your own values, about what, you're, what you can tolerate, what you're willing to do, and what you're not willing to do. Right? Where, where is the line for you? Right, what crosses the line that you're comfortable with? Um, right, these are questions that you have to answer for yourself. Uh, so, the, the, well, you have to answer these questions for yourself. The point of the class is to give you as many resources as possible to help you do that. And uh, the biggest resource that we have co uh, consistently are these uh, case studies. So this is the first big case study that we're going to look at. This is the Challenger disaster. Some of you mentioned the Challenger disaster in your uh, writing last week. Um, and some of you mentioned some other case studies. There's a lot of discussion of the Titanic, which was in the readings. Um, uh, some people even mentioned the Pinto case, which we'll be talking about in a few weeks. Um, but the Challenger disaster is the first uh, case study that we're going to go over as a class. Um, they talk about it in your book on page 106 to 113. Um, you can go online and read a bunch of other information. Um, in fact, let me go ahead and watch. Let's go ahead and watch this uh, first. Booster engine gimbal now underway. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Yes, yeah, so this is the Challenger. Uh, Challenger. Uh, went up to 1980, oh, I want to say 86. Uh, yeah, 1986, January 28th, 1986. Um, actually, uh, just next week, uh, it'll be 11 years. Um, so Challenger goes goes up, and about 70 seconds after it goes up, it explodes in, in the air. There are millions of people watching this live on TV. Right, this is the live broadcast. I'll go ahead and put it back on right now. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. 
velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. So the 25th Space Shuttle mission is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning, it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. Looks like a couple of the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, blew away from the side of the shuttle in an explosion. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink. So, um, yeah, uh, right, millions of people watched this on TV live uh, when it happened. Um, and you heard on the uh, news broadcast the, the person saying that uh, it didn't launch until uh, significant delays before the launch. In fact, this, uh, it, had been launched, it had been delayed several times um, for weeks prior to, prior to this launch. Uh, for lots of different reasons, uh, mostly weather-related reasons. Um, but, so, yeah, so let's, let's, let's talk about this story. So, uh, the Challenger had been delayed several times, and they wanted it up uh, as fast as possible. Um, uh, on January 28th, in fact, uh, on the day of the launch, uh, President Reagan, 1986 as President Reagan, uh, was scheduled to do his State of the Union address later that evening. And he really wanted a successful uh, rocket launch to gloat about in his State of the Union address. Right? The presidents like all these uh, su su successful things they do to, to talk about during the, their speech. And so Reagan was, there had been a bunch of delays, and Reagan was pushing, uh, the, the Reagan administration was pushing NASA to get this uh, rocket up in the air as soon as possible so they could talk about it for his uh, speech. Um, that wasn't the only pressure to get this launch done successfully. Uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the rockets on the ship were built by a contractor for NASA car, called Morton Thiokol. Uh, Morton Thiokol is a, a rock, rocket uh, producing company. Um, it's, ne it's now uh, uh, it went defunct in 2007. Um, Warren Thiokol was, so it was this company that uh, produces these rockets, and uh, uh, at the time of this launch, at the time of the Challenger launch, Warren Thiokol was under contract negotiations with NASA, uh, so they were about to renew their contract to produce, you know, another uh, few years of rockets for the, for NASA, and uh, because they were under contract negotiations, getting a successful launch for this rocket uh, would help those negotiations a lot, it'll help secure uh, the contract. Uh, going forward. Um, so Martin Thiokol also really wanted this launch to go off. Um, it had been delayed several times, so there's political pressure, there's financial pressure. Um, these are the astronauts on board. Uh, I guess I'll just note uh, Krista McAuliffe. Uh, Krista McAuliffe was a, a school teacher. Oh, uh, there, was, there were school children all over the country watching this live in their classrooms uh, because uh, Krista McAuliffe was uh, on board. She was a school teacher. She was the first civilian to uh, be approved to go up in space. Uh, she was a teacher and she was going to go up uh, sort of representing educational interests uh, to get people excited, uh, to get school children especially excited about the space launch. And uh, 70 seconds into the launch, it explodes. Uh, so let's go over why it explodes. Uh, and the big reason why it explodes is because it was too cold. Uh, this is the morning of the launch. There was ice um, all over the frame. Um, uh, 
the ice was, uh, so it was very cold, 39 degrees, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, overnight temperatures of 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is below the tolerance for a lot of the equipment on board. In particular, it was below the tolerance of these O-rings. So let me go over here. So the, so, uh, so this is the rocket, um, and the rocket is connected to the spaceship. Um, and all the astronauts are in a little uh, capsule on the tip of the spaceship. Um, and the rocket, it's a solid rocket booster, uh, and there's a bunch of rocket fuel inside of it, and uh, it also has a leak exhaust. And uh, out of the exhaust link, um, there are these um, O-rings, these little rubber O-rings. They're just supposed to be seals uh, to prevent exhaust leak out of places that the exhaust isn't supposed to leak. Um, so there's these little rubber seals, uh, O-rings, um, and uh, they were supposed to seal up uh, so the, the fuel didn't leak, the exhaust didn't leak. Um, and there were a couple of them, uh, one primary and another backup. Um, and it, were, it was these O-rings that failed uh, because it was too cold the night before the launch. Um, and in fact, it was uh, so cold that it was below the, uh, operating te the known operating temperature for these O-rings. Um, uh, so, the, so technically what happened is that they had, uh, these O-rings were tested for a certain temperature range, um, and they knew that it would work in this temperature range, and they knew it would fail under this range, but they didn't have complete testing data for how cold it would be when these O-rings would still, still fail. So uh, the exact temperature that, that uh, it was the morning of the launch was below the lowest tested temperature for these O-rings. So the, so, so during, so uh, the night before the launch, there was a meeting with Morton Thiokol and all the NASA people about whether they should go through with the launch tomorrow. And there was concern uh, mentioned during uh, this meeting that the O-rings uh, wouldn't uh, be viable because it was too cold. And Morton Thiokol people uh, made the argument that, well, we didn't actually have data for how these O-rings would operate at this particular temperature. So we don't really know if they're going to fail. So because we don't really know if they're going to fail, they might as well succeed. Uh, so these are the kinds of arguments that people are making to try to go through with the launch. Even, so, they, so one more time, they knew that this part was unreliable, possibly faulty. They also knew it was too cold uh, to, be, to have a reliable launch. But there was so much pressure to go through with the launch anyway. Uh, political pressure from the president because he had to speak, uh, financial pressure uh, to renew the contract. Or, um, so all this pressure, uh, time pressure uh, to get the launch off. Uh, so all this pressure combined to get the people to actually go through with the recommendation uh, to, to launch the, the shuttle. Now, um, at this meeting, and this, and this is where we're going to get into the scope of ethical consideration. So at this meeting, uh, Actually, prior to this meeting, uh, the engineers uh, at Martin Thiokol and at NASA um, were, had convinced themselves that this launch would not be safe. Um, and the engineers together banded together and uh, submitted a report uh, um, uh, arguing that the launch ought to be uh, postponed again. Uh, it was too cold. We didn't know that the O-ring was going to work. Um, it was not safe enough. The engineers for NASA and Martin Thiokol all agreed that the launch should go through. But it wasn't the engineers who make the call about whether they go through with the launch. It was the management. And Morton Thiokol management, uh, although they originally supported the engineers' uh, recommendation for uh, postponement, um, during that meeting the night before, they ended up overriding the engineers' uh, recommendation. Uh, the managers said they're appalled by the recommendation. When do you want to launch next April? The idea is that we've already delayed so so long. You, you even heard the newscaster saying, after several delays, we finally got the launch uh, going. Um, so here we have a tension. We have a tension between the engineers on the one hand, who know that the part is unsafe, know that the launch uh, will be a disaster, and recommend that they don't go through with the launch. And on the other hand, you have the management who is responding to all this political pressure and financial pressure, time pressure, um, and they're the ones who want to go through with the launch right now. 
So at this meeting, let me go back to the Prezi. <laughs> yeah, so at this meeting, uh, and your, your book uh, discusses this in some detail. Uh -huh. Uh, there's the uh, uh, there's the uh, vice president of engineering on the one hand who's getting his reports from his engineers saying that the uh, uh, launch is unsafe, but he's the vice president, so he's a manager. He he himself was an engineer, but he's no longer an engineer. He's just the manager for engineers, and he's at this meeting reporting from the engineers that the engineers say don't go through with the launch. But he's just one manager in a, a team of I think three different managers, um, and the other managers want to go through with the launch really badly. And uh, during this meeting, um, one of the managers, the, I think the senior vice president uh, of Martin Thiokol, generally, um, he leans over to the vice president of engineering, the, yeah, the general manager, leans over to the vice president of engineering and tells him to take off his engineering hat and put on his management hat. And he tells him, look, you're, you're thinking about this launch like an engineer, but you need to think about this the way a manager would think about this. And, you know, managers aren't going to just ignore the engineers entirely, but the managers have to put the concerns of the engineers in the context of the larger company interests, right? And the company interests aren't just engineering interests, they're also the interests of financial and political interests, right? And these things are necessary for the operation of the company, and so the managers have to be thinking about these other considerations also. And so here we have exactly this tension of the scope of ethical consideration. When you have your engineering hat on, you make one decision. And when you put your management hat on, you make a different decision. Right? When, uh, or so, the, so the vice president of engineering was originally speaking for the engineers, but when he was told to put on his management hat, uh, he changed his mind. And uh, after changing his mind, the launch is approved, and they go through with it, and the next day uh, it explodes in the, in the air. The point here is not to say that managers are bad, and I know that not everyone in class is an engineering major. Some of you might be business majors or might have interests in uh, being on more of the management side of a business. That's fine. Um, uh, managers have their own ethical issues to deal with. Um, uh, right, and, th and there's ethical issues on all sides here. Um, the, the point that I want to make is not to put the engineers against the managers and say the engineers are right and the managers are wrong, although it looks like that's what was the case in this example. The point here is to think about the scope of ethical consideration, and in particular about how the role that we're playing, right, the hat that we have on, influences the, the decisions that we make. Right? If you make one decision when you're thinking like an engineer, and you make a different decision when you're thinking like a manager, um, right, this, man, this matters. Right? Which, which hats should we put on? Right? Which roles should we be playing? And how does the role that we play influence the decisions that we end up making? Should NASA have been listening more to the engineers? Should the managers have been listening more to the engineers? Right? How do you resolve this dispute between these two, these two groups with, with different interests in mind? It's not that the managers' interests are illegitimate, um, but perhaps they were not properly weighing the safety risks versus these other uh, pressures. Right, so, so what do you think? Is the Challenger disaster, is it an engineering failure? I mean, it was an engineering, it was a mechanical part that failed that resulted in, in the disaster. But it was a part that the engineers knew about and even made a recommendation against launching. Right, so, so what do we say about the engineering, the, the challenge disaster? Is it an engineering failure? Is it a management failure? Right, where is the scope of ethical consideration? How, what was the scope of ethical consideration that made the decision? And how did that... Uh, what are the ethics of making the decision from that perspective? Right? What are the ethics of wearing that hat? So I just gave a brief introduction to the challenge disaster. There's more in the book, um, and I encourage you to do some research on your own. Um, in particular, after the disaster happened, uh, the Rogers Commission is the group uh, appointed by President Reagan to investigate the disaster, what went wrong. Uh, one of the people in the group was Richard Feynman. And Richard Feynman was incredibly critical of NASA for uh, for, for basically this, for putting, uh, for putting political and financial concerns ahead of safety concerns, ahead of engineering concerns. So uh, watch the video from Feynman, uh, read up on the disaster, 
it's worth it's worth noting here that uh, the Challenger disaster happens in 1986, and it's not the last spatial disaster that we face. A few years later, uh, in 2003, was the Columbia disaster. Um, we're not going to talk about the Columbia disaster in class, um, although you might want to use it for your research project coming up later. Uh, let me extend 11. Uh, um, but the Columbia disaster is it's, again it's an engineering failure. It's we launched without being perfectly safe. We knew that there was a problem, but we thought it would be okay anyway. Um, and then it wasn't okay. Uh, for for what it's worth, uh, just to sort of uh, add on to the engineering. Um, issue at stake here. Yeah, so I uh, strongly encourage you to read about all this, uh, uh, the O-ring and what went wrong technically. Um, but another thing to say, though, is that the, so this is the capsule that the crew were in. Um, after it exploded, the capsule was shot free. Uh, and there were no backup measures in this capsule. It didn't have a parachute. Uh, it had no boosters at all. Um, there was nothing in this capsule. Once this capsule was shot free from the rocket, it was just a, a chunk of metal falling through the sky. Uh, there were no safety backups, because every safety backup, right, every parachute or whatever, that's additional weight. Um, and all that weight is very expensive to get up in space. So in order to pare down this stuff as slim as possible, they took out all the safety features, uh, which means that once this thing exploded, the astronauts were just uh, doomed. We know that the astronauts survived the initial explosion, however, right, uh, the capsule itself looked more or less intact. Um, but inside the capsule, right, all the crew is strapped into their things. Uh, some of them might have passed out from the explosion, but we know that uh, at least some of them were awake because the uh, switches and um, uh, all the little buttons and switches in their control panels had all been switched, uh, sort of in uh, in, in, a, in a panic. Um, some of them have guards over them, so you have to like move a guard before you can flip the switch, and even those things were switched. So we, we know that they at least survived the initial explosion and were in a uh, panic uh, trying to flip switches. They all knew very clearly that none of the switches would, would save them, and, and there was sort of nothing they could do. Um, right, so this decision by management um, right, put your engineer hat on, uh, put your, take your engineering hat off and put your management hat on. Right, this decision by management in this video, uh, in this phone call the night before, ends up resulting in the loss of all these people's lives, this huge engineering disaster. Not just a disaster, but I mean, uh, uh, not just their lives lost, but, and, and also not just the money that it cost to do this launch, but also all the science engineering that was put on delayed, uh, that was delayed, uh, uh, be because of this, right, it, it sort of set back, right, we didn't do a launch again for several years after this, um, it set back the whole NASA program for a long time, made them, I mean, some of it was good, it made us rethink the safety issues involved, it made us rethink what we were doing, um, but we ended up committing the same kind of mistake in 2003, and then shortly after 2003, uh, NASA uh, decommissions all its rockets, so nowadays we do not have a space shuttle to put astronauts into space. Um, we still need to get things to space. We have the International Space Station and so on, and uh, we have a bunch of satellites and so on. Uh, but uh, NASA doesn't control any of those launches. Uh, NASA works in conjunction with uh, private companies and with foreign governments, uh, Russia and China, um, to put things in space. So we do no longer have a space shuttle. Part of the reason we don't have a space shuttle is because of these disasters. Uh, right, so, so the implications of these kinds of disasters are not just about the lives lost in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, but also the whole impact it has on the culture, the economy, the progress of technology. So think about the Challenger disaster. Um, this is one thing you might want to talk about in your post. Um, another big thing uh, to talk about for this lesson uh, is women in STEM. So this is uh, one of the big uh, issues for this reading this week is uh, women in STEM fields. Again, this is supposed to be under the uh, under the topic, the scope of ethical consideration. And so I want to think about how women are considered in STEM fields in science, technology, engineering, uh, and math. Um, uh, so we know, so this is, uh, uh, if you click on the link, 
Um, it takes you to the NSF page. And the NSF page, um, if you go to the digest, it gives you an overview of not just women, but minorities, minority women in various fields. Uh, so, oops, sorry. So uh, I just want to show you a couple of charts. These are the same charts in uh, on the Prezi. I want to show you on the website. So just a couple of charts. <coughs> so these are the um, degrees that get high participation from women uh, over the last uh, 20, 25 years, from 1991 to 2010. Uh, you can see that over this time period, uh, psychology has pretty high participation from women. 70% uh, of psychology, almost 80% of psychology PhDs, um, uh, sorry, so psychology degrees, both masters and uh, uh, BAs, um, almost 80% of psychology degrees are given to women. Uh, almost 60% or almost 70, I'm sorry, almost 70 percent of psychology PhDs are given to women. So psychology, uh, uh, women are very well represented in psychology. Uh, men uh, are a minority in psych psychology. And this is an example of a high participation field for women. Uh, Media participation, where they make about 50 percent. Uh, bio the biosciences and social sciences. Um, uh, social sciences, uh, <clears throat> like history and sociology, anthropology. Uh, women make up around 50%, maybe just slightly over 50% in some of these, biology, social sciences. Um, this is going to be an example where uh, women are uh, sort of equally represented, or sort of, uh, the gender difference is split about halfway. So when we get into low, uh, low participation fields, um, you can start seeing some rather stark differences. Uh, Mathematics, uh, closer to 40%. Uh, only about 30% of mathematics PhDs go to women. In the physical science and physics, uh, about 40% of degrees go to women. In this medium to low participation, uh, women are uh, uh, participating lower than you would expect. Um, and then the very low participation are the engineering, um, engineering computer science. Uh, you see less than 30%, in some cases 20 uh, or lower, uh, less than 20% of computer science and engineering bachelor's degrees um, go to women. Now, it's worth saying that women make up over 50% of the population. And uh, even maybe more importantly, this is the uh, Why So Few article. Not only do women make up half the population, but through uh, uh, normal schooling in high school, uh, women uh, tend to do better than men um, in math. So these are uh, grades, uh, uh, credits earned uh, in high school by boys and girls. And girls tend to uh, take more math classes in high school. And in fact, uh, women also tend to get higher grades in mathematics in high school than men. So through high school, where boys and girls are treated mostly the same, uh, girls do pretty good uh, in math and science. But for some reason, when it gets into college, uh, uh, when they start going for their careers, women just check out of science and engineering almost uh, across the board, right? Less than 20% uh, go on to get uh, uh, engineering, computer science, uh, a bachelor's degrees. Um, they stop taking the AP tests. Uh, they take about the same math AP tests. Uh, biology, girls take even more, women take even more. Um, but uh, when you get into the engineering fields like computer science, physics, uh, women are taking much fewer of the advanced placement tests, they're taking fewer of the college courses, and they're getting fewer of the degrees. So what explains this? Why are women being pushed out of the STEM fields? Why don't women find uh, uh, why aren't women encouraged more to go into the STEM fields? Why are, why are they so discouraged? Why do they end up getting pushed out of these fields? Um, and there's, so there's a lot to say about this. Um, this article here, uh, so this is Why So Few. Uh, this is by the uh, Association for the Advancement of, uh, wait, wait. Association, American Association of Uni University Women, sorry, uh, AAUW. Um, where they're looking at why are there so few women 
in STEM. And uh, yeah, so what they say is that uh, uh, in elementary school, middle school, and high school, boys and girls take roughly the same number of courses uh, in math and science, and girls leave high school just as prepared as boys to enter into college, yet f fewer women pursue these majors. Among first-year college students, women are much less likely than men to say they intend to major in science, technology, engineering, or math. And by graduation, women outnumber, I mean, men outnumber women in nearly every science and engineering field. And in some cases, uh, the difference is dramatic, with women earning only 20% only of bachelor's degrees. So why is this? So this is another thing I want you to think about in this lesson. Uh, under the topic of the scope of ethical consideration, what consideration, what interests do women have that make them not uh, feel comfortable in STEM fields? What interests do STEM fields have that make them uninviting to women? Um, where is the disconnect between these? Why aren't women as well represented in these fields? Um, I give some resources for you to think about this. Uh, uh, um, I really like this art, uh, article, The Problem the problem of Women in Engineering. Um, right, where is this problem? Uh, uh, or what is the source of this problem, and how do we correct it? <laughs> One of the things that people tend to say when discussing this problem um, that needs to be as, uh, sort of pinched in the bud. Um, and I think the uh, Why So Few article does this well, um, is that this isn't a difference in performance or ability. Uh, right? w women in high school and grade school uh, perform just as well or better than men. Uh, so it's not a difference in ability. It's not a difference in cognitive ability. Women are just as smart and capable of doing science and mathematics as any man. Right. Um, what's going on here is it's really a difference in culture and in our institutions that we don't create cultures that encourage women to take STEM fields. In fact, we do exactly the opposite. Um, uh, so there's lots of ways this manifests. Um, uh, uh, for instance, uh, boys versus girls toys, strongly gender biased, right? Um, uh, Right, the, the boys <laughs> the boys are encouraged to play oops let me, let me go back here right, the boys are encouraged to play with things like Legos that are building things like cars and spaceships whereas the girls are encouraged to play with dolls uh, and like uh, easy bake ovens and homemaking things and the lesson uh, comes across very clear to children that we expect the women to be in the home and we expect the boys to be doing all the engineering stuff Right, so we're indoctrinating our kids at a very young age right, to reinforce these gender stereotypes uh, where women and men are expected to be uh, professionally. Right? And what this and uh, the result is that girls are just not as encouraged to go into STEM fields when they get into college. Um, women are getting college degrees uh, more than men. Right, the, uh, more college degrees are given to women than men. But women are taking fewer STEM classes, and they're taking more social sciences, uh, biology, uh, the humanities. Um, and again, part of the reason is because we have this culture that pushes an expectation of girls versus boys. Right, so how does this culture uh, result in the gender biases that we see in, uh, in STEM fields? Right, this isn't just uh, about the toys that we play with, of course. Um, oh wait, let me let me throw this image up, which I like quite a lot. Oops. Yeah, how to tell if a, if a toy is for boy, boys or girls? Do you operate the toy with your genitals? Yes, this is not a toy for children. Otherwise, it's a toy for boys or girls. There's no need to be building these gender biases in at such an early age. Um, one of the reasons that people think that there's a cognitive bias here th that matters is, is a result of uh, a psychological uh, trait 
um, that everyone has. It's called uh, stereotype bias. Um, the idea is that when you cause someone to reflect on their own social identity, their gender identity, uh, their racial identity, um, when you cause someone to reflect on their social identity and that identity is associated with a negative stereotype, then people tend to play to that stereotype. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, uh, um, so this works with uh, gender as well as race, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, if you have uh, 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 people of different races or people of different genders take a standardized test, so this is SATs, if you just have them take the test by themselves, uh, they'll perform similarly. But if you start off the test by having them identify their racial uh, identity, um, either identify themselves as black or white, um, the mere fact of identifying, merely asking them to say that they're black or white, or at the beginning of the test, merely asking them to say that they're male or female, will result in a difference in performance. Right? So uh, by themselves, they won't perform differently. But if you have them prime themselves with this stereotype, if you put that stereotype in their mind, uh, black people tend to perform worse, and white people tend to perform a lot better than they would otherwise. And this is the stereotype. Type. The idea is that uh, merely rehearsing these stereotypes ends up with a difference in performance. So this is for, for uh, girls and boys. Um, again, this, I think this is a math, yeah, math test. Right? When you don't stereotype them, right? when you just have them take the test by itself, uh, girls actually score a little bit better than boys. But when you start off the test by having them identify their gender, right, have the boys say that they're boys and have the girls say that they're girls, the mere fact that these, uh, categ these categories are, have negative or positive connotations, right, and it works both, both ways, right, the boys identifying themselves as boys, well, boys are supposed to be good at math, right? Well, they end up performing better at math simply by first telling them that they're boys. And if you tell the girls that they're girls, the girls end up performing worse because there's this stereotype that girls are bad at math. All right, so this is part of the issue in the background. This is part of what's going on with this uh, difference in uh, participation in STEM fields. Why don't women perform as much in, uh, why aren't women uh, engage in the STEM field as much as men? Well, because there's these persistent cultural stereotypes that strongly discourage them from doing so, and in fact, uh, uh, make them, it compromises their performance when they try to enter these fields because of these stereotypes. It's not that women can't do math and science, but it's that when you put them in a culture that thinks that, where the culture thinks that they can't do math and science, then they struggle, and it's completely understandable why they would struggle in a culture that doesn't, uh, that's not supportive in this way. So how do we fix this? How do we encourage women to enter these fields? How do we reduce the biases against these stereotypes um, so that people can perform uh, uh, at their optimum. Right, again, these are uh, questions falling under the scope, uh, falling under the general topic of the scope of ethical consideration. Um, when we're thinking about engineers, remember that we're thinking about um, engineers as such and how maybe women engineers might have a different perspective on things than men engineers. Right, what are the biases, what are the prejudices when we're talking about engineering? Um, what are the gender biases? Or right, has that impact the field? This is another thing you can talk about. If this is an interest of yours, um, please uh, do some more research. Uh, look into this issue. Um, there's a lot to say here. All right. So challenger disaster, women in STEM. Um, the last uh, item on the uh, readings for this week is this. Uh, Commencement address for, oh no, this video is not in Prezi. I'm watching Prezi. Let me make sure that it's still online. Uh oh. Nope. Uh, I will fix that. I will find the right uh, 
uh, video for uh, This Is Water. Um, I strongly encourage you to watch this video. I wasn't going to watch it in this video anyway. Uh, I will fix the link. Watch this video. Um, in this video, uh, David Foster Wallace uh, is talking about just how difficult it is to think um, outside of our immediate situation. Uh, it's very easy for us to think about our own interests, our own desires and goals, and to interpret all of the world in terms of what matters to us. Um, when you think about the world solely from your own perspective, uh, sometimes this might make you frustrated with the world because not everything else operates according to your perspective. Right? Some people have different interests. And when those interests conflict with your interests, sometimes that might frustrate you. But what David Wallace is suggesting in this video is that uh, there's a benefit from stepping outside of your perspective and trying to see things from someone else's perspective. Um, and even more important than stepping outside your own perspective is understanding that you have control over your perspective, that you have control over what you think about and what matters to you. You have control of your values. You aren't just assigned these values from birth. I mean, how you were raised matters a lot to what values you have, but you have control over how those values, what those values are, how those values are expressed, how you act on those values. Right? You have control over that, and having control means thinking about it carefully and being deliberate about what you do, and not just letting your immediate reactions dictate your behavior. Right? Sometimes uh, things make me angry, and I can act out in anger. Uh, but that's sort of an immediate impulse that might not be the best for the situation. And if I can stop simply doing what I immediately think I ought to do, and if I can step back from the situation, assess it, uh, uh, maybe think a little bit deeper, maybe try to think about other perspectives than my own, uh, that might change how I interact with the world. Dave Foster Wallace says, um, learning how to think means really learning how to exercise some control over what you think. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what to pay attention to and, how to, and, and to choose how to construct meaning from your experiences. Because if you cannot exercise this kind of choice in your adult life, you will be totally hosed. So in some sense, David Foster Wallace is thinking uh, in, in the most general terms about what we should consider, about what the scope of ethical consideration ought to be. So watch the video when I fix the link. Uh, maybe read through the full text. This was a commencement speech uh, at a college graduation. So sort of talking to college graduates as they go out into the real world, what it means to actually be in the real world. Um, those are the required readings. Um, the quiz will ask, quest uh, ask questions from the challenger, from the STEM stuff, uh, some things from This Is Water. Um, I do have some optional readings this week. Um, the optional readings, I have another reading from David Foster Wallace. By the way, David Foster Wallace is, a, is an author. He's a writer. Um, he passed away in 2008. Um, but uh, modern writer, very, very popular in the 90s, especially. Um, and uh, he writes a bunch of stuff. So uh, this is Water was his commencement address. Um, Consider the Lobster was an article he wrote on animal ethics. So uh, again, we're talking about the scope of ethical consideration. And in the NSPE, the scope of ethical consideration focuses on the public. Uh, in fact, in most of these professional engineering societies, the scope of ethical consideration is focused entirely on the public interest, the public well-being, public safety, health, and welfare. Are animals included in the public? Are, for instance, domesticated pets included in the public? Uh, because sometimes engineering uh, projects might have an impact on domesticated pets. Or maybe not domesticated pets, pets but uh, wildlife. Um, you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump is keeps saying that those windmills uh, keep killing birds. Well, I mean, if we're concerned about birds, then maybe this is something that we ought to consider. Not, not just the energy that it provides to the human beings, but also the impact that it has on uh, the wildlife. Uh, David Foster Wallace uh, writes an article, Consider the Lobster, where he considers um, the Maine Lobster Festival. It's a big festival in Maine where they eat, eat a bunch of lobster, they cook a bunch of lobster, lobsters and everything. <laughs> Um, big lobster festival, and he compares it to a Roman circus or a medieval torture fest. Uh, David Foster Wallace is not a vegetarian. He, in fact, he enjoys lobster quite a bit. Uh, he wants to keep eating lobster, but uh, going to this place where everyone's sort of gorging on lobster and making a big deal about 
cooking lots and lots and lots of lobster. They have you know big drums where they uh, full of boiling water where they dump in lobster, and they you know they dump lobster in live uh, while they're still kicking. Uh, and the whole thing is a celebration of boiling these lobsters alive. And David Oster, so he's not a vegetarian; he eats meat. Um, but he goes to this lobster fest and he feels a little bit uncomfortable about it. He says, uh, uh, oh yeah, he, so he compares it to a medieval torture fest. And he says, my own immediate reaction to this comparison is that it's hysterical extreme. And yet the reason it seems extreme to me appears to be that I believe animals are less morally important than human beings. And when it comes to defending such a belief, even to myself, I have to acknowledge that, A, I have an obvious self-interest in the belief, since I, act, since I like to eat certain kinds of animals and I want to keep doing so, I want to be able to keep doing so. And B, I have not succeeded in working out for myself any personal ethical system in which this belief is truly defensible instead of just selfishly convenient. Right, so uh, here David Foster Wells is again worried about the scope of ethical consideration. Is it okay to eat animals just because animals are less important than humans? If that's the case, then we have a clear discussion of the scope of ethical consideration. Human interests come first, animal interests come second. Um, right? Maybe that's true, but why do I believe that? Why do I believe that the, the animals come second? Well, David Foster Wallace says, well, look, I, I obviously have a selfish interest in believing this because I like the taste of meat. But that doesn't make it true. Just because I selfishly enjoy eating meat doesn't make it good to eat meat. I might just be a bad person. Right? Maybe all this eating of meat, by the way, I'm not a vegetarian either. I eat meat also. But maybe that just makes me a bad person. And maybe uh, the only reason I keep doing it is for my own selfish interests um, and not because it's actually the right thing to do. I, I might believe it's the right thing to do, and maybe I only believe this because I want to protect my selfish interests. Maybe it's not truly defensible, and maybe it's just selfishly convenient. So uh, you can talk about whether the scope of ethical consideration extends to the animals. Um, but I also want you to maybe think about what is truly defensible and what is merely selfishly convenient, and how do I tell the difference between the two? Right when um, when Bob Lund, uh, sorry, when uh, Jerry Mason, the senior vice president at Mortenthal, tells Bob Lund, the vice president of engineering, to take off his engineering hat and put on his management hat, is that a truly defensible act? Is it the right thing to do to take off his engineering hat and put on his management hat? Or is it just convenient in the sense that it gets what management wants, which management wants, wants the launch to go through? Obviously, management didn't want the explosion. Um, and uh, the fact that there was the explosion uh, was bad for the, for the business. Um, but they were, thinking about, they were thinking about that. What they were thinking about is that they wanted that launch off now. So, so this is what was selfishly convenient, even if it wasn't truly defensible. You might think if they were interested in what was truly defensible, then they would have considered the, the fallout of a major disaster, how bad that would be, and weighing that against the benefits of launching now. You might think if they were actually fully considering what they were doing, uh, that they would have gone through with the postponement instead of gone, gone through with the launch. So think about this. Think about this distinction between what's truly defensible and what's merely selfishly convenient. I talk about this in consequentialist terms. We haven't really introduced consequentialism. We'll do that in a few weeks. So that's animal ethics. The other thing I want you to think about, maybe not, not so again, the scope of ethical consideration, how wide does the scope of ethical consideration go? We've talked about uh, how the scope of ethical consideration extends to uh, women in STEM fields, uh, because they're often like, um, how it extends uh, you know, across the manager engineering divide. And we've talked about how it extends maybe to animals, uh, animal ethics. Um, and this last uh, reading, is uh, thinking about maybe the scope of ethical consideration doesn't just end at the humans or even just the animals, but maybe it extends out to the environment itself. Uh, Aldo Leopold, he gives what he calls the land ethic. And in the land ethic, you're not just uh, ethically responsible to humans or even to animals that can feel pain. I mean, a lot of what David Foster Wallace talks about in Consider the Lobster is whether boiling a lobster alive actually makes it. Make, gives the lobster uh, pain. If, if, if the lobster is in severe pain uh, during the boiling alive, then maybe that's not the right thing to do. Maybe if it doesn't feel pain, then maybe it's not so bad. But uh, some of the discussion about animal ethics has to do with can the animals feel pain? And Leopold wants to take this even further. 
Um, he wants to say that we have ethical consideration for the land itself, right? Not just the animals that feel pain, but also for the soil and the water, the land, right? That we have an obligation to make sure that that soil is uh, sufficiently healthy so that things can grow on it and that it's not poisoned and toxic. Uh, we have an obligation to make sure that the waters flow so that they reach the places that need them. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not poisoned or cut off, right? Water doesn't feel pain. Uh, soil does not feel pain, but soil is a necessary part of any ecological system. Right? And so to understand how that ecology works, you need to understand the full relationship of all the parts. And some of those parts include things like rocks and water and soil. So Leopold says the scope of ethical consideration should be to the entire environment. Leopold argues, in fact, that the history of ethics, the history of progress in ethics, is a history of expand of uh, increasingly expanding the scope of ethical consideration. All right, so uh, 300 years ago, the um, uh, United States declares its independence, um, but it still keeps slaves. Right? So when it thought of its independence, it was thinking of independence for the white citizens, right? the, the right white rich citizens of the country. And then we have uh, you know, a civil war and a fight for uh, uh, equal rights, um, and now we think that the rights extend beyond just the w rich white landowning people and extend to also the black people. Um, and then uh, in the early 20th century, the women uh, who didn't previously have a right to vote um, fight for their right to vote and are granted the right to vote. And so now, again, the scope of consideration extends, again, not just to the men, but also to the women. Um, and you might think that this process of extending out the scope of consideration to be more and more inclusive. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. This is how Leopold argues that progress in ethics is increasingly, uh, is, uh, involves expanding the scope of ethical consideration to include more and more. <clears throat> um, whereas before consideration was very narrow, uh, the history of ethical progress is expanding the scope to include more and more. Um, so Leopold says we should just take this process to its limit and include the entire environment, right? include everything that might be engaged in an ecological uh, interaction in a community of interdependent parts, right? take all of those things that are involved in that community, and they all deserve some ethical consideration. Right? Leopold is not saying that we ought to consider uh, the, rocks and, the rocks and the soils with the same consideration that we give to human beings, because they're not the same, right? They're different things, but they're um, engaged, they're entwined and entangled in the same uh, ecological community, right? Nothing else in that ecology uh, works if the soil isn't uh, healthy, right? If the soil isn't uh, rich in providing nutrients for everything else, the whole ecosystem collapses if, these, if the land isn't uh, in its right place. So uh, Leopold isn't saying that you should give the land the same consideration as human. Uh, what he's saying is that you need to understand how the human and the land are entwined in the same ecological uh, network. And so consideration for any one part of that network requires consideration for the whole. I guess I'll stop here and uh, one last little bit. Um, maybe you disagree with, so for Leopold to talk about does the scope of ethical consideration extend out to the environment? How does the environment relate to the public? Right? The scope of ethical consideration for engineers is about the public. What is the relationship between the public and the environment? Um, you might also, if you want, uh, take this discussion a little bit critically. Is there ethical progress? Do we make ethical progress? You might be skeptical of this. You might think that we don't actually make it. Right? Leopold says that ethical progress is about extending the scope of ethical consideration. But maybe we aren't actually making ethical progress. Maybe we're not better off ethically than we were 50 years ago. I mean, what do you think? Do people know more about ethics today? Do people act more ethically today than they did 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago? Um, or are people more or less the same ethically across time? And then we really haven't changed anything about our ethical situation. Or maybe the things that change about our ethics isn't about people's beliefs, but it's about the infrastructure that we have, 
you know, the bridges and the roads and so on. Uh, so maybe people act just as ethically, but we've built systems that help us uh, do more ethical things, or maybe do less ethical things. Maybe we've built systems that are less ethical. Right, so you might also question this idea of ethical progress. All right, uh, that's the lesson I've been talking long enough. Um, remember, your post for lesson two is going to be due this Friday on 127. Your replies for lesson two are going to be due uh, next, uh, uh, the following Tuesday on 131, the end of January. Um, you have your replies for lesson one due on 124, that's tomorrow. Um, so make sure you get all that done. Uh, ask me if you have any questions, uh, concerns, uh, and I will be in my um, uh, office hours uh, online in the online hangout section on Tuesday morning from 12 to 1.30. So uh, I hope to see you there. Um, I, I think that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for sticking around for the video. Uh, I will see you next week for lesson three.